Good evening, everyone. I'd like to begin by extending my thanks to everyone for your time this evening. Uh, we've put together a really interesting Editor Circle event here for you tonight, uh, one that we hope will provoke some interesting discussions about the intersections of history and the news. I'm Dr. Sasha Mullally. I'm a professor of history and at the University of New Brunswick and welcome from uh, Fredericton. Um, I'm also the chair of the board of Canada's National History Society. And I send out this warm welcome from my home in Fredericton located on the traditional lands of the Wolastaque First Nation. The Wolastaque are sometimes historically referred to as the Maliseet and their name translates more or less to the people who live on the beautiful and bountiful river and I spent the better part of the afternoon and will return briefly later on this evening to taking photographs along the banks of that river uh, because it's, it's convocation week here at my university and I have many young people to celebrate. But like you, I decided to take some time for Canada's National History Society this evening because I am an admirer of Peter Mansbridge, <laughs> whose career as a journalist has literally anchored my consumption of journalism for more decades than I care to admit here tonight. And I am mindful that we live in a moment where truth in news is hotly contested. And the same is true for history. Debates over what should constitute the appropriate focus of our historical attention are offered up and debated with almost the same intensity as debates over what constitutes real news and fake news. And so I am especially pleased to bring together um, thematically tonight and welcome you to an event that sets up the news as history's first draft. And I know that a new flock of graduating history students will join me in saying that, uh, that in fact, this is true. And in fact, uh, their historical training probably sets them up as the kind of critical thinkers that we need in order to um, cultivate a society that can differentiate between what is quality information and, and what is not. So as a journalist of great integrity, I'm sure the sort of practice that we associate with both journalism and history, critical thinking, careful review, and a focus on your sources uh, is something that Peter Mansbridge appreciates as well. That's all for me then by way of introduction. I'm now going to sit back and enjoy the proceedings with the rest of you. And I'll turn things over to our host and moderator, the editor in chief of Canada's history magazine, Mark Reed. Mark, over to you. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you very much. And thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, it just seems like yesterday, this, uh, some of us anyway, we're getting together for a virtual soiree for the editor's circle. Um, and I'm really, really thrilled and excited to have our special guest with us tonight, Peter Mansbridge, who, uh, you know, it's funny, David Letterman has an online uh, interview show now called My Next Guest Needs No Introduction. And I really feel like that is appropriate in this case. Um, you know, in terms of, of, of uh, reading off his biography, everybody knows him. He is the voice that was in your living rooms for decades as the uh, chief correspondent and chief anchor of the uh, CBC's flagship nightly newscast. Um, he has won countless awards. He's a member of the Order of Canada. He's a former chancellor of Mount Allison University. Um, and he's a, a best-selling author. And so tonight we're gonna be talking to Peter um, about two things. We're going to be talking uh, about his new book, Off the Record, which is an autobiography and a, and a, um, a memoir of some of the moments that, that um, were truly historic for him. Uh, but we're also going to talk a little bit about something that he broaches on in the book, which is the idea of trust. And the idea of trust in terms of journalists, in terms of the public, in terms of, uh, I guess, those moments of history and how we record them. Um, but I also, uh, before I finish my, uh, my biography, if you will, of Peter, I want to talk a little bit about uh, more so the Peter that I met by reading his book. Um, because his book is really an autobiography, but it's also a window into some of the most newsworthy moments in the past half century. And so a little bit about Peter, and obviously uh, he talks about fact-checking and the importance of fact-checking. So, so clearly if I get something wrong, Peter, I'll put a correction in tomorrow's paper. It'll be very small in the bottom right-hand corner where we always put the corrections. Um, but uh, Peter was born in 1948 in England, the son of Stanley and Brenda Mansbridge. And his grandfather, Harry Mansbridge, fought with the Princess Patricias at Vimy Ridge. Uh, 
was wounded. And like something straight out of the movies, of course, while recuperating in hospital in England, he fell in love with his British nurse, Alice. And of course, Stanley, um, the, uh, you know, his father was born at a military, Canadian military hospital in England. Now, when the Second World War broke out, Stanley joined the Royal Air Force, and it was mostly because his father didn't want him to be a soldier. His father uh, remembered the horrors of trench warfare and did not wish that upon his son. Um, and so after the war, his father worked for the British Foreign Service, and within a few years of his birth, uh, Peter's family uh, were stationed in Malaya. Now, after a few years in Malaya, the family relocated to Canada, and there's an, an amazing anecdote in Peter's book about why his mother uh, particularly preferred Canada versus Australia. Now, Peter, did it honestly have something to do with the accent of Australians? <laughs> that, that's what she said. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that uh, she actually meant it, but she, that's what she told us. She couldn't see my sister going up, going to school in Australia. Um, and ending up with an Australian accent. She she found that a little too much. She, she thought the Canadian accent was better, eh? Exactly. You see what I, you see what I did there? Um, so now it's the 1950s in Ottawa, and Peter's dad is now a member of the Canadian Civil Service, uh, the Federal Civil Service. And growing up in the 1950s, one of the things that really struck me was about uh, Peter's uh, description of how he, his sister, and his parents would have these amazing debates around the kitchen table. And, you know, obviously kids like to argue with their parents, and uh, I think that's not something that's unique. It, it still happens to these days, but um, the way Peter described it in his book is that uh, so often these were about the big the big moments of, of the of, of the day, the big news hits, and um, I believe it was your father, Peter, that really was um, uh, prided, prided himself on debating. And um, in a way, you mentioned that this sort of had an influence on you. And so I wanted to kind of start off our questions tonight by that, by by how did those family discussions, how, what kind of impact or influence did they have on you in shaping you as a journalist, even though at the time you didn't know what the future held. Uh, I certainly didn't. I had no idea what the future might hold for me uh, or, or even what I was thinking in terms of what might be a, an exciting future. Listen, uh, we were lucky as a family. Uh, my brother and my sister and I grew up in a family where the parents were home every evening for supper, like every evening that I can remember growing up through school. My dad had a you know, senior position in the, in the civil service, but he worked nine to five, basically. And so he was home at supper time. And the thing that he always encouraged at the dinner table at night in the dining room, you know, it, it wasn't sort of TV tables around the, the television or anything like that. We were sat in the dining room and he, he would encourage us to talk about the issues of the day, what we'd learned that day, what we'd heard on the news that day and talk about it from every possible angle. Now, I think he was just doing that as a way to keep us informed about what was going on around us, but it was having this impact on me, even though I didn't realize it, that this would be actually what I would end up doing for a living, which was being informed, learning about what was going on each day. And, you know, and uh, the opportunity uh, as I had to tell others about what I'd learned. Um, so those early days were incredibly important uh, for me as things turned out in terms of what I ended up doing uh, for a profession. Um, and I'll, uh, you know, I always credit that, uh, th those early days, my dad for sure, but my mother as well. Um, and, and not everybody was in agreement about some of these issues and that uh, encouraged us to debate them and talk about them. And, and my dad always felt that that you should take turns on in, in terms of the uh, position in the debate, take the other side. And when you're comfortable with one side, try it from the other side. Uh, so it, this was a way of encouraging to hear all sides of a, a discussion. You know, it's, it's funny, uh, we'll come back to that a little bit later, because even just the idea of debating one side and then flipping it on its head, it seems like today, um, not to editorialize, uh, but if people were willing to do that a bit more often today, we probably wouldn't be having this discussion about the lack of trust and fake news, if people could actually flip the coin like that. Uh, but Peter, before we get to the awards and the meeting the royalty, 
uh, and uh, you know all all those accolades. We have to get through high school first. And one of the other things, no, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to show your book to my children, uh, because it seems to me that young Peter Mansbridge didn't quite uh, excel in school, um, did not graduate summa cum laude, as they say, um, and, and uh, ended up joining, of all things, the Royal Canadian Navy in the hopes of becoming a pilot. Um, I, now, I, it I didn't, didn't quite work out, but uh, can you just walk us through really quickly um, the idea of that, where that is relevant in terms of the story, quote unquote, that everybody knows or thinks they know about your discovery as a baggage handler in an airport in Churchill, Manitoba? Well, let's put it this way. Uh, you know, I didn't do well at, at, at high school, not because I was a a bad student as such, but it was because I didn't apply myself. I, you know, I was always in a rush. I didn't think things were uh, that interesting the way they were teaching uh, school. I mean, I did well in history. You'll be happy to know. I, uh, history always fascinated me, uh, but most of what else was on the curriculum did not. Um, so I got into the Navy as a young officer, officer cadet actually, uh, out in uh, Squimal, British Columbia was where I started, then went to Camp Borden of Barrie, Ontario, and then Portage La Prairie um, for advanced flying training. So I was in the pilot program uh, for, well, a little more than a year, um, but I had the same problem. I, I, did, I was okay flying. I wasn't so good at, uh, uh, at, at ground school. I wasn't uh, spending enough time, uh, you know, applying myself to the studies involved. And so, as it turned out, I mean, they weren't going to take a chance on me, and and, and good for them. But those were this was a long time ago, '66. That's when we had a in the Royal Canadian Navy, we had an aircraft carrier, the Bonaventure, hmm. um, out on the east coast, and that's where I would have been flying. That's probably just as <laughs> just as well that I didn't, um, because it was a very small aircraft carrier. Uh, and, uh, you know, it might have been a bit of a challenge for me to successfully land every, uh, every time on that. Anyway, so I, I, you know, they asked me, why don't you go to sea for five years and maybe come back and do the, the flying bit. I was not keen on that idea. Uh, and so I got out. Um, and as it turned out, I mean, I, was, uh, I had a lot of friends uh, still in the forces and still in the Navy and still as a part of that uh, class I was in back in 66 and 67. In fact, I was just on a, a conference call with some of them last week. But the um, uh, it, it afforded me the opportunity to use some of the skills I'd built up through the Navy and some of those skills that I'd, I'd learned at home about being fascinated about what was going on around me. And then I fluked my way into a job at the CBC I stopped along the way working for a little airline in northern Manitoba called Transair, um, and I worked in Churchill. I was based in Churchill, Manitoba, and uh, somebody heard my voice announcing a flight, and the next thing I knew, I was working at the CBC. That's the kind of HR department they had at the CBC in the, uh, <laughs> in the late 1960s. They didn't ask too many questions. <laughs> good voice you were in. Nobody asked me about my education or anything like that. Suddenly, I was um, working at the little station in Churchill, Manitoba, CHFC. And, you know, one thing led to another. I started telling stories on the air. People heard them in Winnipeg and in Toronto. Uh, I moved down to Winnipeg and worked at CBC Winnipeg on Portage Avenue um, for five years. And uh, moved from radio to television. And, you know, it, it, I won't bore you with all the details, but one thing led to another. I went to Regina, then Ottawa, a little bit overseas. And the next thing you knew, I was in Toronto uh, anchoring the national. So, Peter, before we before we move on to, I guess, the other part of our night, I am curious about one thing, though, because when you got hired at the station in Churchill, mm -hmm. there's, there's again, there's a great anecdote in your book, uh, which, of course, I'm going to plug. I'll plug the book. There it is. It looks just like the guy on the cover. Um, I was wondering how long it was going to take you. you yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 I should have had a T-shirt made. I could have just been wearing it. <laughs> Um, but one of the things that struck me, and again, it goes back to those discussions around the table. You talk about how the job you actually were offered was basically like a disc jockey. You were playing music at late, late night music and then doing the sign off for the radio station. And it wasn't more than probably a year. I made my, my dates wrong. 
when you came to your boss and said, I need to do news. I'm a news guy. And you, you invented a newscast called that. What was it called? The, the news with Peter Mansbridge. Um, what was it that compelled you that, that made you think you weren't going to be uh, like Johnny Fever from WKRP, but you wanted to be Walter Cronkite? What, what, was, what, what was it that, that young Peter Mansbridge was thinking and, and was inspired by in terms of making that decision? Well, I, I was smart enough to realize if I was ever going to make it in the business, it wasn't going to be with music. Uh, because I just, I, I'm not very good at anything music. I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't pick winning um, records and songs. Um, but I did love uh, and was fascinated by the idea of doing newscasts. And the, you're right, they did not have one in Churchill at that time. And so I suggested we start one, we try one. And they agreed initially and said, okay, well, like two minutes a day, nothing happens at Churchill, small, small community. But in fact, a lot of things happen at Churchill. And so I just started, you know, doing the uh, phone around of all the different people who might know something about what was going on, whether it was the police or the fire department, the rocket range, which we had in Churchill back in those days, um, the, the local government, all of that. Um, and so, and polar bears, anything to do with polar bears, that was a winner. You knew you could turn that into a story and, and it would go far. They, Still a winner. They, 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 they loved the stories in Winnipeg and they loved the stories in Toronto. Um, so anyway, that's how it started. It started two or three minutes a day. It eventually ended up being a half hour uh, newscast each day. And I do it all. I do the interviews. I edit the interviews. I do the writing and I do the, obviously the hosting. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't want anybody to play one of those right now because <laughs> I'd probably be embarrassed by the quality of them. But that was how it started. Uh, and it was good enough to not only gain an audience in Churchill, but to attract attention outside of Churchill. And that's how I began the move into uh, greater things at the CBC and getting the opportunity to be trained in a proper way uh, through the CBC system. Now, now you um, you mentioned something again. Um, I I'm hoping we have enough time to make it through all the questions I have. But one of the things that you mentioned about after you moved to CBC Winnipeg in the '70s, and I think it still it still rings and true and speaks to the idea of trust, which we're going to get to in a little bit, is the idea of diversity in the newsroom. Mm -hmm. And you talked about in your book how there was actually more diversity in Churchill than there was in Winnipeg because you had Indigenous journalists and others working in the station. But once you hit the newsroom, it was a sea of, of white male faces. Um, and you mentioned the first woman to actually get a job there um, and the challenges that she faced. But you talked about, um, you went on a little bit more about just the importance of diversity today. And especially for the country's national broadcaster. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about why that, why was that so important that you felt like you needed to, to include a chapter about that in your autobiography? Well, I think diversity, uh, whether it's the national public broadcaster or, or, or the company down the street, uh, is incredibly important, especially at this time in our history. Um, uh, we all know the, uh, the issues surrounding especially Indigenous uh, peoples in, in our land and the way um, uh, they've been treated uh, by the non-Indigenous population and at times by their own leadership. Um, but including Indigenous peoples in our, um, you know, broadcast operations, it, it, you know, it was a natural part of the Northern Service where I started working because that's why it existed. It existed to, uh, uh, you know, be able to have a dialogue with the Indigenous people of Canada's North. Um, and so some of the staff were Indigenous and, and, and spoke in the languages that were appropriate to that particular audience. But you're quite right, when I got to, uh, to Winnipeg, now this was, you know, 1970, 71, uh, it was an all white, mainly older newsroom. I was a young guy and looked upon with some disdain by the veterans in that newsroom at the time, most of whom came from print that being at the, either the Tribune, the old Winnipeg Tribune or the Winnipeg Free Press. Um, but they gave me my grounding, my understanding of, uh, of journalism in those days. So they were incredibly important to me. But the fact there were no women, there were certainly no, uh, it wasn't diverse in the sense of um, 
you know, race or color or uh, gender at all. It was all elder, you know, it was all older white guys, basically. Um, that started to change initially with women to the point now where it is, you know, you can go into any newsroom and not just the CBC, but any newsroom in the country. And you should see a reflection of the Canada you see outside the newsroom. And in most cases, you do. So that's a major um, change in the way things have, have operated in, in the last 50 years. There's still a distance to go uh, because often in the senior management positions, that same kind of reflection of the Canada you see outside is not the Canada you see at the more corporate level. But that's changing as it should. And, you know, one of the other things that I, when I, uh, when I, when I, I guess threw my Hail Mary and hoped you'd answered and join us tonight, uh, I was, I was secretly excited about chatting with you as well because of your passion for history. And again, um, in your book, two themes really resonate with me. Um, and I think when you went, if, if our, if our audience hasn't, haven't had a chance to read the book, when they get a chance, they, I think it will with them as well. One is the North and the other is the military. And the thread that weaves these together is, it seems to me for you is history. And so you write very passionately about your visits uh, to Vimy Ridge, um, walking the beaches at Juneau Beach and, and, and other beaches um, along Normandy. You talk about the Franklin expedition and voyages you've taken along the Northwest Passage and standing at those graves of the crew members. And I just wonder, what is it particularly about those two topics and then that thread of history that compels you so greatly, not just as a journalist, but also just as a Canadian? Well, listen, you know, Canada has a distinguished military past. Is it um, without blemish? No, there are blemishes on that past. But having said that, it's a significant part of who we are and what we've achieved. Uh, you know, you mentioned Vimy. When Vimy happened in April of 1917, the country was 50 years old. And yet there are historians, as you well know, Mark, who will say that Vimy was really the birth of a nation. Now, there are other historians who argue that, and I'm not going to get in, into that. But nevertheless, that was an important moment um, in, in terms of our history. It was the first time Canada had operated under Canadian command, and it showed a certain, um, uh, you know, individuality on the part of our nation in a major conflict. We have a distinguished record through the Second World War, Korea, um, Bosnia, Afghanistan. I mean, there, there are things to be proud of. There are questions about uh, the military, as there should be, on everything from uh, procurement to uh, the treatment of women within the military. I think you're going to see in the next week or 10 days a report come out that's been underway for the last six months or so in, into that very issue, and it's probably not going to be very flattering. So I'm not naive. I mean, my eyes are wide open. But, you know, when I go to uh, parts of our military past where, where the history shines through, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what has been accomplished. And... I certainly take note of the courage of, of Canadian soldiers, uh, airmen and, and naval personnel through a lot of different areas. So that's my sort of passion for the military. My passion of the, for the North was bred out of, you know, my early time there from Churchill North before the CBC when I was working for Transair because I traveled all over the Arctic. Um, the One of the biggest stories unfolding in the world today and has been for the last generation has been climate change and the pointed end of it for Canada has been in the Arctic uh, and you can see what the future holds by seeing what's happened in the Arctic. I go up there a lot. I was just up there a couple of months ago for a documentary I uh, did very recently on the CBC um, about the changing nature of our Arctic and the argument over sovereignty and everything else which is so important to our future but it's all linked to climate change. So those stories are incredibly important to me. And, you know, it's part of our history. And, uh, you know, as you know, the journalists try to write the first draft of history. They don't always get it right, but they're trying to. Uh, 
you know, and I think I don't want to give away everything in your book, Peter, but um, there were some moments that really resonated with me. One was talking about your fireplace where you have stones in Stratford and you have stones, you have a piece of the Berlin wall, you have stones from the great wall, you have pebbles from Juno beach um, elements from Vimy Ridge and even from the tunnels under the Vatican. Um, and it's basically a fireplace of history mm -hmm. where history happened. And then the other moment that really struck me is when you were underground uh, visiting the tunnels below Vimy and you found all the etchings and drawings and the, um, and the notes that the soldiers themselves lived or left as they were hunkered underground, praying to whatever belief they had that they didn't get blown to smithereens. Um, and when you come out, uh, this quote really resonated because my, um, I know your grandfather was wounded at Vimy and my uh, great, great grandfather, um, I believe I don't have the greats right. He was actually killed at the Battle of Corselet and his name is on the Vimy Monument. And I didn't know that the first time I visited. It was only the second time when I discovered that and I found it. I literally stood there and wept over this man that I had never met mm -hmm. uh, and could not explain why. And yet when I read your quote, when you said you came out of the uh, tunnel after two hours underground and just sat there and enjoyed the beauty of, of a French evening in June, you said, quote, I never felt more Canadian than I did in that moment. And I think that's something maybe you might agree that you, you only understand if you have a passion for history, obviously, but if you actually go to where history happened. It's so true. And, you know, listen, I, I've been extremely lucky in my career. I've got to travel the world, been around the world a couple of times. So I've been all over Canada. I've been to every nook and cranny in Canada. Um, there's nothing like, especially for somebody who made their living kind of in the studio for 30 years, getting out of the studio, being at the actual location of where stories happened or where stories are happening. You know, I was in Berlin when the wall came down. I mean, these were great moments. Um, and so when you go there, you are, you know, you're transported in some cases back in time as I was in those tunnels and trying to imagine what some of those guys must have felt in those minutes that they were, or in some cases, hours waiting to be given the signal to go out over the top. Um, trying to imagine that, realizing that these were all young Canadian kids, you know, most of them, I don't know, average age, 21, 22, some as young as 16, you know, they'd lied about their age so they could, go to war because they believed it was important. Um, you think about those things when you're in those locations in a way that you can't think about them when you're trying to report from a distance, whether you're writing from Winnipeg or broadcasting from Toronto, it's just not the same. Um, so those are, you know, those are special moments when you travel through the Northwest Passage. You know, I've done it a couple of times. Uh, it is something that 99% of Canadians will never get a chance to do because it's so expensive to travel into the Arctic. Um, there are only so many ways you can do certain things in the Arctic. Uh, but it is one of the most spectacular areas in a country that's full of spectacular areas, as we are. Uh, but to go there, knowing the history of it, knowing you know, the, the dangers that were uh, that uh, more than a few people had to put up with as they tried to find the Northwest Passage, the Franklin Expedition being just one of those cases. But, um, you know, it's pretty special place. It's always meant a lot, uh, meant a lot to me. Now, one of the things I, um, I, I'm not really a poet, but I, I came to really admire the poet Alden Nolan when I lived down in New Brunswick. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to read his poetry, um, you should. And there was a poem, and I'm going to get the name wrong. I should have, of course, I'm not as well prepared as you, Peter. I should have it on my screen. But it was something along the lines of the ballad of the, of the night news editor. And the whole poem, if you've never read it, is about uh, literally a moment-by-moment -moment decision in a newsroom as they have the, new, the, the, the front page is ready for, for tomorrow. It's ready to go. When suddenly there's a breaking news hit that the president has been shot in Dallas, that Kennedy has been shot and no one can confirm it. Then suddenly it's like he's, it's confirmed and he's wounded. Then it's confirmed and wounded and you're there. it's constantly, well, we're gonna have to move this to page B3 and this is gonna go here, there. And at the end, he dies, obviously. And 
the front page story last minute is decided it's Kennedy's assassination. And, but, it, but the thing that killed me about it was at the end, it says it's not until later, hours later when I'm in bed, that I actually realize that Kennedy is dead and that I care. <laughs> and that's what came to mind as I was reading about in your book. And as we transition to this idea of journalism as the first draft of history, um, there were a couple moments that stood out to me in your book. Um, that show both sides of this in terms of the anchor as the face of calm and the human behind the face of calm. And one was the 9-11 terror attacks when you were on air for, I believe, up to 44 hours straight in the preceding hours and, and days after those 9-11 terror attacks. An event where it's so tragic, it feels like the center can't hold. But also you talk about a smaller moment when you're in Israel. And there's been an explosion. And Toronto calls because they know that Mansbridge is in, on the ground. Let's get a live hit. And they call you up. And in your own words, the emotion, the rawness of it hits you so hard that you, quote, lost it. And you basically just gave it kind of a very raw emotional update. And then the phone line went dead from Toronto because they were not expecting that. They just were not able to comprehend what just happened because you were so raw and emotional. And I wonder, um, what is it like as history is happening to be the face of calm? And also what is it like within that face of calm as, as, as history is happening, as you're writing that first draft of history? Well, you gave two, uh, Two great examples there. Obviously, 9-11 was, was the kind of day that it's only going to happen once in your career. Uh, you know, I was in the studio uh, for the whole time, as, uh, as you noted. Um, but the story was unfolding in front of me, and we were dealing with developing things all the time. But you're sometimes when you're in the studio, you know, you're looking at a monitor, and the full grasp of it doesn't hit you. Now, you know, obviously, I knew it was awful. I knew that thousands of people had, had likely just died. Uh, we saw the planes going into the building, all of that. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, it was terrible. But the human side of it didn't hit me until the middle of the night on that first night. Um, I, I took a break during a longer item. Uh, and went into my uh, dressing room, which was just off the studio, to change my shirt and suit. And I saw the light blinking on my phone, and um, which it was a private line. And so the only person who could have called and left a message would be somebody who was close to me. Well, I checked the voicemail. It was like four in the morning. And it was my daughter in Winnipeg. Um, and she, the message simply said, Dad, I've been watching you all day. Um, just want you to know I love you. That was it. Um, I put down the phone and it that struck me hard because it suddenly made me realize that this story was so big that people were reaching out everywhere to their families, to their parents, to their children, to their aunts, uncles, grandparents, whatever. Um, they just wanted to reach out and touch somehow. And, and, and that, you know, I, I was different after that in telling the story. I'm not sure whether anybody would have noticed it, but I was different. I noticed it uh, in terms of how I felt. I was more connected to the story because I was in a way connected to the audience and what they were going through. The other one, there'd been a, a suicide bomb attack on a bus in, in, uh, in Jerusalem. And I happened to be there doing a story on the Intifada, doing a documentary, actually. And it was just, you know, a block and a half. And there was no doubt that there'd been a huge explosion. You could hear it. And so I rushed out the door with uh, my cameraman and we ran down the street. We got there. There was, you know, it, it was not a, a pretty sight. There was, uh, you know, a, a lot of, there were a lot of casualties, and mostly dead. And... Um, the next thing I knew, Toronto was calling and they wanted to go on the air right away. And, they, you know, they asked the kind of normal questions. And then suddenly the anchor in Toronto said, how many are dead? And I was, I was furious because, you know, I said something like, 
I said, this just happened. They're literally picking pieces of bodies off the street and off the walls around this bus. I have no idea how many people that represents. And that's when, <laughs> that's when the line went dead. I mean, I didn't say it that calmly. I, you know, I was upset. Um, they, you know, they, the anchor and the producer sent me a note and po- apologizing for the question. And they hadn't, they didn't have a reason to apologize. If I'd been there, I'd probably would have asked the same question if I'd been in Toronto, um, but I wasn't in Toronto. And it gave me a much better indication of, you know, I, I've done some foreign corresponding over, over the years, not a lot, certainly not as many, as much as the, the great names and the veterans in, the, in that business that you, you would be aware of at all Canadian networks. But I, I you know, I, I knew a few things, but when you're there, there's nothing that can replace that experience of what it's actually like. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's what kind of came through that day. And so I, I told that story because um, not to criticize anybody, but to explain kind of what happens in these situations and how quickly um, you're caught up with what you're witnessing. You're trying to tell the story accurately and responsibly. Uh, but in some of these cases, it's pretty awful what you're, is unfolding right in front of you uh, as, it, as it was that day. You know, Peter, I think that's a, um, I, I don't want us to, to uh, I feel like we could talk for a couple more hours, uh, but uh, I, I just think it's important for the audience here tonight and anybody else who sees this, if they have not worked in the news business to, um, understand the pressures that come w- with the news business and what it's like even amplified a billion times when you're working for the national flagship news organization. Um, uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're barely a comparison. Maybe people know this, maybe they don't, but I came out, I'm not a historian. I came up through the journalism world and I remember working for Cam West News Service and being on the phone and getting upset, not angry, but getting upset because something had happened in Alberta and it was five minutes later and the reporter was still in the parking lot. And I was asking how many kids had fallen down their crevasse. Like, like how many are injured? And, he, and, 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 and the fellow blew up at me. A good friend of mine blew up at me. He's like, I'm in the blanking parking lot. I haven't even gotten in the car yet to drive the three hours to the Rockies in Southern Alberta. And this was back in, in early 2000 where you had to find a fax machine to be able to plug your computer in to send your story. I can't even imagine what it would be like for the national news. And so getting back, I guess, to, or coming around to the theme of the evening, journalism is the first draft of history. In your book, you write that journalism is based on trust created by a pathway of truth, but you say that that has taken a beating in recent years. Um, Now, over the weekend, I took my daughter up to Lake Winnipeg. We had a great time, um, ate some ice cream, went to the cabin on the way home, I saw a sign just as I hit the perimeter. And it said, the, and, and someone had erected this massive sign, the media is the real virus, is a sign that someone put up there, is someone angry about COVID. And so it gets me back to this question of, if historians are to look at journalism as the first draft of history in an age in which this erosion of trust is happening. Number one, what is causing the erosion of trust? And what can we do about it so that we can ensure future historians and others can even trust themselves what they're reading or or watching? Right. Well, that's the basis of a lengthy discussion. But let let me point to part of the answer here. Um, Trust is based on truth. And Truth is the most important thing. You know, without truth, you have nothing. Without trust between you and whether it's your sourcing or your audience, if you don't have trust, you've got, you've got nothing. We're at a, we're at a major point in, in the history of, of journalism right now because trust has eroded. Trust has eroded 
for a lot of different professions. Obviously, for me, I think that the profession that can uh, allow that to happen least is journalism. It has to have that trust factor going for it. And as I said, trust is based on truth. So you have to be able to convince your audience that you're telling the truth. In a world where it's full of misinformation and disinformation, disinformation being the deliberate attempt to influence people by putting out false stories. And that can be done by a country, it can be done by a company, it can be done by a news organization. Um, sadly to say. Um, and then there's misinformation, which is just getting it wrong and being sloppy in your journalistic methods. And the more journalistic organizations there are out there and the influence of social media on those news organizations, you get a lot of misinformation, but you get both. So if you want to be trusted in this particular era, um, you've got to deal in truth. You have to be able to convince your audience that what you're dealing with is true. And to do that, you've got to be more transparent than I'm afraid most news organizations are being about how they tell their stories. You know, what's news, what isn't news? Why does something deserve to be at the top of the program as opposed to others that are dropped down the lineup? You have to be able to explain why you spend X amount of time on one particular story and not so much on others. You gotta be able to explain little things like, you know, why do you give anonymity to some sources and not to all sources? Or why do you give it to any sources? You have to convince them, you have to earn their trust that you've done something like that, the anonymity question, because not only is it the only way you'd be able to tell the story which you believe to be true, um, it's also the only way that you can accurately reflect the importance of the, of the story. And that there's no, in the vetting you've done of this source, there's no hidden agenda as to why they're giving you this information based on you not, not saying who they are. So there are, there are a lot of different elements to the question you ask but it boils down to the one area and that's truth, which leads you on the path to trust. If you don't have one, you're not going to get the other. So I'm conscious of the, the time, but I, I, I want to just uh, eco just a couple more minutes of our, of our, of our conversation period before we go to questions. And so you know, one of the one of the ironies I find, I deal with uh, historic newspapers all the time in terms of putting together Canada's History magazine. It's a it's a great source for us. We can go back and find clippings from 1900 and something, and we'll run it. We'll even have a little we'll we'll crop it out and put it right on the paper. The one question, and I'm realizing this even more so now with our conversation. I don't know anything about the reporter that wrote that story. I know very little about the newspaper that published that story, if it was published in the 1800s or early 1900s, 1930s. And then I go back and I was actually doing a little research today about this idea of journalism as the first draft of history and objectivity, trust. And I realized there was a bit of an irony, which is if you go back to the 1890s, when the phrase yellow journalism was invented, and it was invented in, in New York, um, a massive battles between two New York rivals, um, Joseph Pulitzer and William Randall, Randolph Hearst had competing newspapers. And they created this style of journalism which was based on sensationalism, totally torquing the facts, getting it wrong, doesn't matter. We just need to, sell. whoever sold the most copies wins. And then somehow, because I mean, I'm from the journalism or, or the, the, I'm from the generation, Peter, where, I wouldn't have got a job if I didn't have a journalism degree, right? And so you, you came up in, a, in an age where you, you had a great voice and you had a nose for news and it carried you to, to, to tremendous places. There's lots of people now that would never get a, get a sniff in a newsroom unless they had a master's degree in journalism. And we were taught about objectivity. But you mentioned in your book as well 
about how the rise of social media now has kind of allowed people their own personal feelings and opinions to creep into their reporting. And so it used to be the standard yellow journalism. You, you know, everybody knew that was a Tory paper, that was a Whig paper, and you, you wrote opinion. Then it was objectivity. Now everybody with a Twitter account thinks they're an opinion columnist in a way. And, and I just wonder in terms of that, what hope you have at the moment, um, given all the, all, the, all the facts you talked about in terms of what's impacting trust and eroding trust, um, are we able to put the genie back in the bottle? Is, is that idea of journalism objectivity, you talk about the bias versus lens that you view, um, you, knew, you view a news event. Um, have we passed the, uh, the point of no return or, or, or is there something out there that's giving you hope? Well, I, I take hope from discussions like this that take place, and they don't just take place between the two of us. They do take place in newsrooms, real newsrooms, in different organizations across the country. Um, and, and, and they have to, because we are, as I said earlier, we're at a critical moment uh, in terms of the future of journalism. I mean, there's a lot of things happening in journalism today, a lot of things happening in the uh, the landscape of different media organizations uh, that are going to influence the journalism of tomorrow. But nothing's more important than trying to achieve that trust. Now, once again, you know, I'm not naive. I mean, let's face it. You and I read books, and I'm sure so do our audience, by great authors, journalists um, for decades in some cases. Um, and every once in a while, there'll be a new book will come out, let's say, for example, on the Second World War. And people would say, I didn't know that. That's a whole new development in you know, the Battle of Stalingrad, whatever. I've never read that anywhere, and I've read every book on that battle. But here we are in 2022, and there's, there's new information that's being garnered in some fashion. So, you know, when it's the, they say the first draft of history because there are often many drafts of history. And, you know, you've got to trust that author. You've got to believe, okay, this guy is somebody I trust. I've read other things that he's written or I've heard what other people have said about him. I've seen the way he came up with these stories. He details in his book how he's transparent, how he got the information he's got, and that's why I've chosen to believe him. But the story's changed over time. So did the first guy get it wrong or the first woman get it wrong when they wrote it in 1946 or whatever? Or is it just journalism has got that much better in terms of sourcing, in terms of where they get their information, how they get their information, that we're able to advance the story? So... Some of that is always going to happen in, uh, in, in the way we look at journalism. But it's still, it's always going to come down, Mark, to this, this issue about truth. And well, who's truth? You know, like, and what is truth? I mean, that's what we've been going through for the last five years. And I won't bother naming who got us into this. Um, but, you know, th this issue of what is truth? Who's truth? can I believe um, those are, are like Im important questions to determine this whole issue that leads to trust and you know uh, our clients our audiences have to decide who to trust you know I've always I've always argued that the, the news making business is kind of three things as journalists who promise to provide as much information as they can get. There's the, the newsmakers, whoever they may be, who are promising to provide information. And then there's the public who wants information. And if the public doesn't want information, they're going to get twisted by one of those first two groups in terms of what's out there in terms of knowledge. But if they're looking for where they can trust, they have to determine that and decide that, okay, I trust that organization. 
or that particular journalist. And that's what they go with because there's so many choices out there to make and so many different drafts of history on the same day. I mean, just look at the last 24 hours out of Texas. Yeah. A lot of different ways that story is being told. And you got to determine in your own mind what you trust and who you trust that's telling you the truth. Well, with that in mind and, and conscious of the time, uh, I'm going to open it up to uh, any questions. If anybody has a question, you can throw it in the chat or, or uh, unmute your mic and ask the question if you like. I know our publisher, uh, Melanie Ward, has asked the question. Um, my eyes, sorry, my progressives aren't as strong as used to be. My screen is very small. It says, why in the face of irrefutable evidence, Peter, are there people who still do not trust the source as evidence. Truth is necessary for uh, trust, but is it sufficient? Well, it's sufficient if you choose to believe what you're being told. Uh, and the argument by whoever's telling you is, you know, is sufficient enough for you, for you to make that decision that you trust it. Uh, but we we've suddenly are living in this world of conspiracy theories on you name the topic, and there is one out there. Um, I mean, look, look at what happened through the pandemic and still continues to happen on some of the things that are believed and not believed uh, about the way it's been handled. But there's much more than that. I mean, it, it, it kind of, you know, it started decades, if not centuries ago, but it, 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 in our generations, certainly in mine, it really started with the Kennedy assassination, which you referred to earlier where this distrust of government in terms of what they were telling us started to spring up within a year of that assassination. The majority of Americans didn't believe what the Warren Commission had said in terms of its conclusion that Lee Garvey Oswald acted alone. Um, and that's never changed. And that build upon on top of that conspiracy uh, over after conspiracy on all, all kinds of issues. So there is that kind of market out there for conspiracy theories, but never as great as it's been in the last couple of years. When you have a, a you know, a president of the United States um, who believes in conspiracy theories, and he's got a, a significant number of people who believe everything he says, even though so much of what he says is a proven lie, um, that's a huge problem in trying to in, in encourage a population overall about what's true and what's not true. You made a good point in your book, Peter, um, of, and, and just even a second ago when you said that it's not necessarily new, um, because another moment in your book that struck me was when you sat down with Margaret Thatcher um, and tried to interview her about the Falklands War. And I actually laughed so hard when you described how the scorched earth she basically set under you, basically trying to give you a tongue lashing for apparently not knowing what you're talking about or not doing your homework. Uh, and, and ironically, in the context of your book, she, uh, she gave you a good uh, tongue lashing for not reading her book, which I thought was hilarious. I actually had to Google it and I looked it up. It's online if people want to watch it. There's uh, Peter Mansbridge uh, doing his best as the Iron Lady uh, gives it to him for not reading his book, for daring to ask a question whether or not, I believe, you know, in those dark moments of the night or whatever, um, when the boat's on its way to the Falklands, did you ever have a moment of doubt whether or not you were doing the right thing? And her first comment is, well, clearly you haven't read my book. Yeah. And which I actually sadly, thought to which myself... Sadly, which sadly I had read her book. Uh, and if I had any, um, had the, the, the right approach, I would have said, did you write it? Because she didn't, uh, as opposed to my book, which I which I wrote. Yeah. But anyway, that's beside the point. But listen, I you know I had a relationship with Margaret Thatcher in, in terms of a, uh, an interviewer. I'd interviewed her a couple of times before uh, while she was prime minister. This is after she'd been kicked out by her own caucus, uh, and she was you know flogging a book around the world, uh, the Downing Street years, and um, and, and she she kept using that same approach. You obviously haven't read the book. The question, and you repeated it, is a good question. I'd ask it again today. It wasn't, it, it wasn't critical of her. It was simply asking a question. I've always been fascinated by leadership in, in, in times of crisis. Um, and she could have taken us inside that 
moment. But she chose not to instead uh, just to, uh, you know, slap her interviewer down. Of course, at the end of the interview, you know, when the lights were off, she looked at me and smiled and said, well, Peter, would you like me to sign your book? <laughs> you know, that's it was not, very, I, I, I don't want to. Uh... That's not what I had in, intended to give, to ask her to do with her book. But nevertheless, I did in the end get her to sign it. I'll just make a quick comment and then we'll go to another question, which is, of course, like, I believe that either that was very Trumpian of her or Trump's comments where he would attack the reporter and say, well, you're just a terrible reporter. As soon as you ask him a question he doesn't like was very Thatcherian, uh, one or the other. But uh, some of the other questions, we're actually getting some really great ones here in, in the chat. Uh, Bruce McClellan is asking, is the mainstream media's attempt to compete with social media, hip, fun, short clicks, now uh, news driven by clicks, is it actually making the mainstream news media um, worse in a way by feeling the barrage of all the social media and all these other, I mean, you mentioned the, the impact of Facebook, Twitter, organizations who claim YouTube, who claim not to be news organizations, but are directly in competition with more established news events and, and, or a news agency. I wonder, um, is, is that social media click-driven focus really um, hurting mainstream media? Sure. First of all, let me just say that Thatcher would be appalled to know anybody would compare her with Trump. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't go too far with that or she'll reach out of the grave and grab you. Um, listen, if you're going to follow someone into the gutter, you're going to end up in the gutter. And that's what I'm fearful. It's a good question because there's no doubt some major news organizations have tried to emulate what they see on social media as a way of going about getting an audience. That is uh, signaling the, the death knell. They're going to they're gonna lose that battle and they're going to lose it on all fronts. Um, it's, it's a time, and, and listen, there, there are examples of, uh, of the opposite. Uh, you know, we, we tend to perhaps give too much credit to the New York Times and the Washington Post as great newspapers, but they are great newspapers. And people have gone back to both the Times and the Post in these last couple of years because of their journalism, they believe, they trust it, they believe it, and they didn't take the, the route through the gutter to get to that point. They took the route by pouring money and substantial amounts of it into solid journalism, and they're being rewarded for that. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that the publisher of the New York Times, it was less than 10 years ago, um, said the print edition will be gone within five years. Hmm. Well, it's not gone. I mean, obviously, the online edition does extremely well, but there's still, the print edition has gone up in terms of its circulation, um, and the same with the Post. I mean, they're both great news organizations and they should be the examples for others that are struggling in different parts of the world and are toying with uh, uh, going against the traditions of, of great journalism uh, to try and salvage an audience. Well, Peter, uh, again, I, I don't know where the time has gone. We've already come and gone and I apologize to any, um, anyone who has questions in the chat. Um, but we are already at an hour and uh, we still have a couple exciting things we need to do tonight. Now, first of all, um, you're a good throw man. Uh, if I ever decide to, to, to become the national anchor of, of, I might hire you to throw me to the news because you mentioned good journalism, which brings me to a person who's doing great journalism, which is you. Even today, Peter, I find that, you know, in retirement, you have um, a wonderful podcast uh, you know, on Sirius XM uh, Canada, if anybody has a chance to listen to it, it's called The Bridge. Um, you can go to his website, thepetermansbridge.com, or even check him out on Twitter. He's very active there. And I think, you know, for fans of yours um, who trust you, I think it's a real fantastic resource that you continue to uh, bring important uh, topics and discussions to Canadians and, and really can, can uh, continue the journalism that you, um, you know, that you became so well respected for over the decades. So we appreciate that. We thank you for that. And I am now going to hand the evening over to President and CEO Janet Walker. Thank you, Mark.
I'm going to start with just a couple of brief words of thanks. Peter, thank you so much. This was very, very interesting and enlightening. Imagine us having this conversation about trust and truth and to be guided, Mark, by you on this conversation. It, it's helped us to sit back in our chairs and listen and learn and believe we are part of a dialogue that's going to change some things. And uh, may this be one of those beginning pieces. We will need to be equipped with the book that you have um, shared with us, Peter. I think it's a beautiful book off the record. And I want to just say thanks, everyone, for being here this evening, for taking the time to join us and uh, for helping us explore stories behind the history. May I wish you all a very lovely evening. Thank you again.